on the subject. So let's get on with the show now and meet our first company, Anteris Technologies Limited. Thanks, Peter. Um, good morning, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for uh, taking the time to hear our presentation this morning. My name is Wayne Patterson. I'm the CEO of Anteris. Um, we're a company that is in a very exciting space at the moment, uh, very big market potential and uh, very rapid growth. But the space we're in uh, is the aortic uh, heart valve space. We, are, we make valves for uh, the aortic heart valve replacement. So our product is called Durovar. It's made uh, with two different technologies that I wanna bring your attention to today. But we're in the business of making the most durable and clinically superior heart valve. Both of those are big claims. I'll prove to you and show you why uh, we can make them. So we're in a space, an industry called the structural heart industry. It's, uh, it's, it's the name referred to for these kind of products. And Anteris brings two distinct technologies to this space, ADAPT and Durovar. Both of these technologies, in my opinion, create um, an unassailable moat around the company. ADAPT, for example, took 20 years to develop. So there is a fairly big uh, gap between uh, getting to where we are and trying to enter into this market with what we have. The space that we're competing in is about 10 billion US dollars uh, by 2025, it's, it's growing dramatically at 15, 16% compound annual. So let me talk about ADAPT. ADAPT is an anti-calcification treatment uh, that we use to treat the material that we make the heart valve from. Now, calcium is an extremely important aspect of this story. The disease that we treat, aortic stenosis, is a function of your native valve calcifying heavily. That's part of the disease. So the material that, that deflects or rejects calcium is really important in this space. Uh, ADAPT, however, is not new. We used it in other uh, areas prior to this, before we made heart valves from it, uh, which is great. It's not experimental. It's FDA approved, in fact. So we're halfway there on the FDA side. Uh, it's been used in 20,000 patients globally, so biocompatibility is proven. Now, we took the ADAPT material and we turned it into an aortic valve, and the valve is called Duravar, basically stands for durable uh, aortic valve replacement. Um, this in itself is also quite a unique and novel technology. It is the only 3D single-piece aortic valve in the market for the treatment of aortic stenosis. The other valves are quite complex and they're manufacturing three pieces of tissue. Uh, and by the way, you're born with a single piece 3D valve, not three pieces of tissue. So it is much more anatomically correct. Um, it does have unique properties by itself. It gives better hemodynamics. Uh, and we've had this now in preclinical and clinical studies. And I'll show you what that looks like. So let's talk a little bit about what this disease is. The disease is aortic stenosis. Now, when you are diagnosed with severe aortic stenosis, it means the valve in your heart is heavily calcified, it builds up calcium, and the opening of that valve narrows uh, significantly, and therefore the blood pressures and everything else goes up. So those leaflets tend to slow down, and eventually they have to replace that valve or it's, uh, it's fatal. Now, there are a couple of ways they, they do that. Uh, up until the last six or seven years, the only way to do this was to basically crack open a patient's chest called a thoracotomy. Um, as you can see here on this diagram on the left, go into that patient's uh, chest, uh, put the heart on bypass, stop the heart, go in there and replace that valve. Now this procedure takes about four hours, up to, up to four hours. It can take you about six weeks to recover. The problem with this procedure is that it's got a high risk of mortality, uh, death for patients who maybe are above 80, 85 years of age. So it's not suitable for those older patients. So they didn't really have a solution. Now, to answer that problem, uh, two companies came out with products into the market six, seven years ago, where they managed to take that same valve, essentially the same valve, put it on a catheter, and rather than cracking your chest open, they would insert that catheter into your femoral artery down near your groin, drive the catheter way up over your aorta, as you can see there, drop the valve in place and remove the catheter. So it's a lot less invasive, of course, not cracking your chest. Now, that procedure can take 25 to 40 minutes and you're out of hospital the next day. So that in itself uh, is, is quite a dramatic breakthrough and patients suddenly have had alternatives. So because TAVAR was originally used in uh, patients who are greater than 80 years of age, the valves were never really designed to go uh, any real distance in time. Uh, in this case, the valve and the patient probably had this about, the, about the same lifespan. Now, durability became a real issue. That is heart valves that last longer um, because some of these valves were, they can start to wear out at two years and they really can start to decline in that period of time. However, five, six, seven, eight years is probably more likely to be when those valves start to decline rapidly. Um, and they decline because they calcify uh, remembering this disease has calcification as one of its key markers and they mechanically wear out because they're not your native valve. They do have these structural uh, issues. Now, what happened in 2019 and why do we need longer lasting valves? 
well, the FDA cleared the use of these products based on a couple of studies last year into uh, patients who are much younger. So the mean age, the average age of patients went from 85 to 73 years of age in one year. Now that patient is very different. That patient is obviously gonna live longer. Um, they're gonna live well into their 90s probably, uh, but they're also gonna be more active. At 73, they're still playing golf and so on. So there is a real need for a valve that lasts longer, but also one that works better hemodynamically. Um, the current replacement valves, uh, they work, uh, they don't last that long. And the hemodynamics, they don't give you back the normal function that you had before you had the disease. They sort of stop a little bit short. As you can see in that picture on the right, that's what a valve looks like that, that was removed. This is one of the marketed valves. You can see that big calcium buildup. So that restricts the function of that valve dramatically. And by the way, these uh, devices are about 35,000 US dollars. So about 40 to 45,000 Australian dollars per, per unit. Um, so they're not cheap. Um, if it takes 60, 70 years for your first valve to decline and only five to seven, eight years for the second one, it obviously leaves a big gap in the market. Now, valve material and valve design are really important parts of this. And we are novel and unique on both sides. The ADAPT um, anti-calcification technology I talked about is an Australian invention. It was invented in Australia. Um, and hands down, we have a lot of data on this. I think no one is disputing that our anti-calcification properties are the best in the industry. They've been very widely studied in humans. And, and, ADAPT, and ADAPT is actually FDA approved. So anti-calcification is but one part of this. The Duravar valve, of which is made from ADAPT, is again that unique 3D single piece valve. And that's really important because it gives you much more normal uh, blood flow, normal hemodynamics once this valve has been impl implanted in patients because you get this much bigger opening, much more normalized because of this single piece design. So what does a 3D valve look like? Well, it's anatomically correct for a start. And it sounds strange to say it out loud, but it is the only anatomically correct valve in the market at the moment. You can see here how our valve is made. Uh, all of the other valves are made of three pieces of tissue, so they're quite complex in the construction, but doesn't give you a normal valve function. We get about an 85% uh, increase in the coaptation. That is the opening closing area of these valves and about a 35% reduction in the stress. That's the mechanical wear and tear compared to conventional valves. So we already know that we're mechanically uh, wearing out much more slowly than the other valves. Most importantly, I think, is we've got superior hemodynamics, superior blood flow because this valve is opening far more uh, in, in the normal manner of a normal valve. Now, there are a bunch of reasons why these valves decline uh, in humans, the ones that are in the market. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but a couple I want to bring your attention to. Part number one, we just talked about the calcification. This material is a, is a collagen coming from animals. We all use essentially the same material. We are the only ones who will be able to remove all of the DNA out of that scaffold. That's proven. Now, that DNA is a big contributor to calcification, so we believe this is why we don't calcify as much as the other uh, products. That zero DNA aspect is a huge uh, benefit. On the other side, though, on the mechanical side, um, the other valves are very complex, the, the, the older generation valves, and the three pieces of tissue do not give you that optimal hemodynamics, that blood flow, whereas our, our single piece valve, much more normal in its, its shape and function, gives you much more normal blood flow, as well as a lot less mechanical wear and tear. The other thing is the other valves, due to their complexity, are made up with about 600 sutures, and each one of those sutures makes a hole in the valve in the tissue material, uh, and so that considerably weakens the valve. That's a well-known fact. Because of our single piece design, we have many more, uh, many less sutures than that in, in this construction. But here's the important part. There are uh, experiments, of course, you have to run to prove that your valve works. Uh, one of them is uh, an experiment run on a device called a cycle tester. Now, the magic number here is 200 million. One cycle represents a heartbeat. So this is a device of experiments that all the, the companies use to measure uh, and accelerate the aging of their valve to see how long they last. Now, the FDA requires that your valve at least lasts for 200 million cycles, which is about three to four years of human use. Um, we've run our valves out to uh, beyond 600, 650. And I just want to pause on that because that is 12 to 13 to 14 years of human use. That's a lot. Now, more importantly, we've seen that the function of our valve on day one at 100, 300, 600 million cycles, you know, out to, to 13, 14 years, the function of that valve is not declining at all. That opening uh, area is remaining the same size as it was from day one. We have run competitive valves in these experiments and they tend to start to decline in function by about 250 million cycles. Now, none of us have data in humans out to, to 15 years or whatever, but this is a good surrogate to say, okay, mechanically, our valve, because of that unique design is lasting longer. 
and so going to meet some of the uh, requirements of the market. The picture you see on the left is one of our Duravar valves. Uh, it looks fantastic in the cycle tester. You can see that machine is just making the valve open and close, so it's pushing fluid through there. That single piece valve is just billowing very, very nicely, as you can see. So we have a durable valve. It's mechanically uh, sound. The tissue science is uh, above reproach and creates that uh, competitive advantage around our product. And as a result of the tissue science, the, the adapt processing and the single piece valve being married together, we have a more durable heart valve. Uh, that's only really part of the story. Uh, the other part is how it functions. We know it lasts a long time, but how does it function? So we have gone into a human study um, in Europe uh, and with, with an air in a center where they've done a lot of early uh, valve work. Professor Maris is in fact a preeminent uh, professor in this space uh, and very well published and very well known internationally for this kind of research. The echo you can see here on the right is our, one of our patients. That's a really nice echo showing the Duravar valve uh, in situ there, uh, working very nicely. But what I wanted to talk about here is the normal hemodynamics. When you present to a doctor with severe aortic stenosis, you have a very high blood pressure, millimeters of mercury, around about 40 or 50. Now, when they replace your valve with the current valves, it'll bring you down to about 10 to 15. Um, normal is five or six. 10 to 15 is okay, but if you're younger, you want normal blood flow. You can see here, we've got the results from patient number one from this study. His blood pressure, his mean gradient in millimeters of mercury is five. It's right in the normal range. Uh, and the opening area in the normal range is about three and we land right uh, in that zone as well. Now we took an average of patients just to give some context uh, for non-medical uh, observers of this data. And in the center where Professor Meris did these uh, patients, he took an average of patients, uh, 1,400 patients who had received uh, commercial valves, currently available valves. And you can see there, the average blood pressure is about 11 and the average opening is about 1.9 centimeters squared. So far uh, above the normal range, certainly you can live and you function, but when you compare that to Duravar, you see a much more normal profile hemodynamically. And in fact, Professor Meris went as far to say publicly that he has not seen these kind of results that he has seen with our valve from commercially available valves before. And we know that because we have a lot of clinical data from all the other valves and we talk to a lot of doctors. But that's a big step forward to be able to provide that functional cure uh, approach with a valve that also lasts probably the life of the patient. Now, Anteris uh, is you know, based in Australia. All of the inventions I'm talking about now are Australian. And we have our factory where we produce the ADAPT material, we manufacture our valves uh, in Perth. Uh, it's of course FDA approved and, and regulatory approved, uh, and it's a medical grade facility. That's important in this story because a lot of small companies of course outsource this kind of thing, which is risky and costly. We don't, we own the facility. Um, we're on the pathway to going to FDA. In fact, the news flow from here is really uh, extraordinary. We are in dialogue with the FDA uh, at the moment, have been for many weeks. We will be uh, submitting for our FDA study here in the United States uh, around about Q1 with a view that that study will commence in Q3. That'll be a huge catalyst for the stock, obviously. Uh, those first couple of patients will be hugely important. We expect to see the same results we saw in the European study, which is that we are getting patients with a functional cure. So right off the table, they're getting very normal results. There is a lot of IP around our products, both the ADAPT treatment, the Duravar valve itself, and the catheter that deploys that valve, up to 80 patents at the moment and, and expanding very quickly. So there's a lot of protection around our IP. We're supported by an advisory board of Tavara doctors in the United States here, and we're expanding this group. Now, just a word on these doctors, um, just so we're understanding how, um, how relevant our science is. These doctors represent some of the top Tavar doctors in the world. They're on the podiums, they're giving presentations medically, they're well known to, to some of the other big companies, um, and they're both clinically and academically uh, extremely uh, important. Now, some of them here, Dr. Kapati here at Cleveland Clinic is the director of Cleveland. Cleveland is in fact, you know, the, uh, the biggest cardiac center in the world. Uh, so it's critically important. Now, small companies don't get to have advisory boards like this. The reason these gentlemen are with us and they have been working with us for a couple of years regularly uh, is because they believe the science and technology is, is revolutionary. These guys are all doing, you know, upwards of five, 600 tab hours in their centers per year. So they do a lot of tab hour procedures. Um, there are many here who are just very well known. And I, I would say to you, if you want to Google some of these names and find out what they, who they are and what they do would be uh, very valuable. Now the market space is huge. Um, there's only two players in the Tavar space. Uh, one of them has 60% roughly, the other one has 40% market share. It is therefore not a huge leap of faith to project that you could take significant numbers, 10, 20, 30% uh, 
market share if you have a clinically superior product, which we believe we do, based on the data that we have so far. Now, just some numbers there. If we got 10% of the US market, uh, which is, I think, very modest, it's 600 million US dollars, 20%, 1.2 billion, 1.8 billion at 30. These are big, big numbers uh, with only a couple of players. So uh, there is a lot of potential for this product um, and only potential because this product is so dramatically different to what's in the market. Now, um, as a, a validation of that, this week, uh, just this week, we were awarded the best innovation uh, and, and our product was presented by Professor Maris at PCR London Vows. Now, this is the most important meeting of the year globally uh, in the cardiac space for this kind of uh, product. It was a competitive process. So to be awarded the best innovation above all and every other person who entered their, the, every company who entered their product is a huge validation of the, uh, of the scale of our technology and the, and the relevance of our technology. Uh, there's a lot of catalysts coming through. Uh, as I said earlier, we've got the, the human study still rolling in Europe, results come out. Uh, we are having other studies where we've got readouts, obviously the FDA applications going through uh, and all of those things coming to fruition during the course of next year. Uh, so there's a lot going on with this company. But I think bottom line is the Durava valve lasts longer and it works better. Uh, we've proven durability, you know, the calcification stuff is very clear, less mechanical wear and tear that affects these other valves, but we have better outcomes. We have lower blood pressures uh, and bigger openings. The EOA is the opening area uh, because this is a unique single piece design valve. So it's very different to what's in the market at the moment. And that's why we see these results. So it's the right science. Uh, I think the ADAPT anti-calcification treatment uh, developed in Australia over 20 years has given us a flying start to this space. We're very much ahead of the curve for what it takes to develop a product like this after a couple of years to be going FDA study already. Um, it's the right design, of course. The single piece valve is anatomically correct and the only one that is. And it's the right time. The FDA clearing the use of these products in younger patients only last year means that the valves in the, the current valves in the market probably don't go the distance that they need to or work as well as they need to for this group of patients. So having that younger patient audience has really played to the benefits of our product. So on that note, I'd like to complete my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Wayne. Let's uh, remind those who are watching that you can ask a question. Uh, the icon at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A. That's the way you can fire a question into Wayne. I'll kick off, Wayne. Um, really interesting presentation. And like a lot of people watching this, I think the first thing they might do is go and look at the share price. And you guys were once close to 90 cents and now you're around three or four cents. What has happened to the market's appreciation of what you've done and what lies out there? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, and that's a very good question. The we and we did consolidate the stock, obviously. So you're talking in pre-consolidation numbers, but I think this company, like so many of the, I guess, the small cap healthcare companies, uh, find a, a path through the market. Now, originally, this company was not a cardiac valve company. Uh, in fact, we've been doing that for a couple of years. We didn't have the ADAPT technology for a long time. Um, now that was pivoted into a different market surgical repair, which uh, from my mind does not, it was not a huge market potential product. Certainly wasn't gonna make the family fortune with the available market that that product could sell to as distinct to where we are today. But there was also a drug development business attached to this company. Uh, and I originally joined the board of this company. I came from 25 years of working in global big pharma. I was in the C-suite for Merck and Roche around the world. And so therefore, I think I was bought in for that business. I promptly stopped funding it because the uh, the drug development business, I think, was driving the share price in days gone by. Uh, but as we all probably know or should know by now that, uh, you know, drug development typically is a domain of, of larger companies. It takes about a billion US dollars to get a drug to market in about 10 years. Chance of success is about 5% when you're at phase one, phase two. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a long shot investment thesis as best for a small company. So removing those aspects, I think, certainly there are a lot of our longer term investors were invested in a different kind of business. That being said, we're probably about three years ahead of the curve right now, according to what the, the bigger companies tell me about the development cycle for the, our product. So it should take about five years to get to where we are, it's taken us about two. Um, so I think the market's just gonna catch up. We can deliver the results as we continue to do so. And I think 2021 is when you'll start to see that re-rating or price discovery on this stock as we get the FDA approval for that study to commence up here in the States. Okay, here's a good question from Paul. 
assuming you get full FDA approval, what is the distribution model in the USA? Realistically, how many months slash years before you earn revenue? So I think the, the, the quick answer to that is partnerships. We are, uh, there are four big device companies. Uh, they're all headquartered here in Minneapolis. It's Device Central. So the global headquarters of the companies are all here. Uh, we know them at the C-suite, they know us. Uh, the path to market commercially in our case would be a, a partnership. There's no question about that. Um, the revenue stream, I think, uh, you know, in a model like that, you kind of built with an upfront royalties, milestones and so on. Now, the, the, the actual FDA approval of this product, uh, we would be somewhere in the, in the range of late 2023, 2024 uh, for approval. The revenues could certainly come before that. And I, I do believe a deal with one of the majors who we are regularly talking to would certainly come along before that as well. Uh, so there's uh, a few years to market, but the, uh, the revenue uh, potential, uh, deal potential is much, much sooner. This question from Robert King, do you have an idea on how long this valve will last in the patient? As long as the 13 or 15 years you've tested, will the calcification return even with the technology you have? Yeah, look, that's a great question. That's one I, I couldn't answer uh, accurately over beyond the data we've got. Now, what we do have and what makes us unique is that the ADAPT technology has been used in humans in another setting. We've got 10 years of data showing zero calcification in humans. We've replicated many studies. There was a big multi-center study uh, with about 500 patients over five years as well, showing the same thing. Because we have that zero DNA component, no one's gonna catch us on that side. Uh, so you'd have to believe that uh, the data so far will, will translate into the valve setting. Um, you, but as far as I could say, because of that zero DNA, um, and because of some of the studies we've run, we've definitely shown that we just calcify less. I couldn't say if it's going to be zero for 20 years, uh, but it's highly likely because we understand the reasons why we don't calcify. Now, the mechanical part, I think, is really critical as well. Having that data that I showed previously over 13, 14 years, that's a mechanical process. You can't, that, that, that's going to be the same in a human body. That thing is going to open and close so many times. Now, nobody has that data in humans. These products are too new for that. Uh, but we certainly have the longest data set that I've seen showing that data on cycle testers. Uh, and we've seen competitive valves kind of die out at 250. We've gone out to, you know, um, over 6 million, uh, 600 million by now. So, uh, you know, to the extent you can translate it, I would say our valves are definitely showing every indication uh, for reasons we understand, like the mechanical design and the calcification treatment, that they will last the life of a patient in the younger patient setting. Finally, for Nigel Williams, how do you plan to fund development going forward? So I think the, there, there are two stages of this funding, of course, getting uh, the first and the biggest phase of development, I think has already occurred. Uh, the ADAPT process took 20 years to develop. If you had to do that from day one, that would be difficult. Uh, all of the valve design work has already been done. Uh, the catheter design work is all but finished, will be finished by the end of this year, early next year. So the next step is funding that study that's about $20 million. Uh, when the FDA, FDA study starts. Then there's a, another wave after that. That will be taken care of during a partnership. Now, there have been Tavar companies before us. They didn't certainly have the data we have, uh, and they were all bought before they got FDA approval. Uh, and those represent the current products that are in the market, the first generation. And if you want to think of it that way, we, we, we would be the second generation. Well, Wayne, good luck with it. It's a very interesting product, and um, I wish you the best. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate the time.